Um, now, uh, this is something I would like to actually cover on pragmatics, which is um, a well-known term called implicature. Explicature and implicature. There are two terms, really, not one. Uh, explicature is, uh, gives you the, um, uh, the information and uh, it's an explicit meaning that you are looking for. Implicature, you're no, uh, looking more into the connotative meaning of that. Grice, who is well known in this area, he uses the term implicature to refer to what the speaker means or implies rather than what he or she literally says. That's really an issue in interpreting, really, with this one. Because what if somebody, A, says, shall we go for a walk? And the answer was, or is, it's raining. يعني لنذهب في لنسير أو لنذهب في مشوار إنها تمطر. Here I don't know whether I mean of course Grice suggests that the speaker can signal an implied meaning conventionally or non-conventionally. To signal an implied meaning conventionally. A speaker uses the textual resources, the conjunctions, because, um, you know, that it, to give you that it is conventionally uh, what it is, which are conventionally understood to signal certain relationship between the propositions, what you are proposing here, what you, what you are uh, putting forward as a proposal uh, or proposition. So shall we go for a walk? It's raining. هل نذهب في مشوار؟ إنها تمطر. Now, this is, what does this implies, really, in the answer? And that is where implicature is actually uh, working here. Implied meaning does not signal, or which is not signaled conventionally, i.e. you don't see it there, very clearly indicated. Um, and, of course, there is what's called, according to Grice, we've got the cooperative principle and the four principles, which is quantitative, quality, or quantity and quality and relevance and manner. And here is an example. Uh, look at me, I have uh, made an error here. It should be, there is a full stop next to E. It should be EG. Let me just fix that. Because that's something that I should have uh, noticed it, but I did not pay attention to it. So here, what we see is, is an example. Correct me if I'm wrong. Or, you know, how would you say that? Sahihli إِذَا أَخْطَأْتْ إِنْ أَخْطَأْتْ Yani, of course, he's not implying that he's wrong. You know, correct me if I'm wrong means I am right. Uh, I am 100% right, perhaps. You know, I mean, this is a problem of, uh, how would you interpret this? You say, Sahihli إِنْ أَخْطَأْتْ for am I going to be wrong? In the first place, I think the speaker is not saying that he's going to be wrong, but he's trying to say, look, I know this is a fact, but correct me if I'm wrong, because I know this is what I know as being correct. And here's another one. How can he be so cruel? You know? And, and the actual fact, كَيْفَ لَكَ أَن أَن تَكُونَ بِهَذِيَ قَسْوَةً you can actually interpret it or translate it as أنت قاسي القلب جدا يعني there is a difference in a way the way it's been put but then of course there's an implied meaning how can you be so cruel يعني كيف يمكن لك أن تكون قاسيا بهذا الشكل هو لم يقول it did not say you are so cruel but you can see Sinclair's example very interesting and Duff's example 1990 is also just as interesting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and how can I be so cruel? So you can actually translate it, كيف لك أن تكون بهذه القساوة? أو هل أنت أو نترجمها أنت قاسي جدا. يعني sometimes you might use that in, um, in subtitling. Here's some um, glimpse on what Grice is saying about the maxims, the four maxims, quantity. 
He says your contribution as informative as required, not more informative than is required. So you need to have to keep to the same amount of information. Don't give more than what you should in terms of inform information. And quality, it means that your contribution needs to be true, not to say something that you believe to be false and not to say that for which you can lack or you lack adequate evidence. If you don't have evidence, don't state something that's not true. And then the next, next one in the third one, in the maxims, which is relevance, contribution, contributing what's relevant to the current exchange of the dialogue, if there is a dialogue going on. For example, um, you know, when uh, the guy goes to the, uh, an employee goes to the finance uh, department and says, uh, I haven't received my sick pay. I have six children. Can you tell me why? Of course, here, he's not asking the finance department in his company, can you tell me why I have six children? That's not relevant. He's asking, why did you not receive the sick pay? He has got six children. In other words, he has got six children. He wants to feed. Therefore, he needs the money. So pay me the money, you finance. So why aren't you paying my sick pay? So you see, that's what's relevance. Also, in manner, you can need to avoid ambiguity, obscurity of expression, and be orderly and be brief. And here, for example, if you ask somebody to say, the train to Jeddah, okay, if you say, when is the train, when is the Jeddah train? And if somebody says, yeah, you mean to Jeddah or from Jeddah? You see, here's an ambiguity here. And you say, from Jeddah, and then they will tell you, the time. So things relating to the implicature are very, very important, uh, Grice's uh, notion of conventional co implicature. And his proposed maxims, which we looked at as quantity and quality and relevance and so on, they overlap with some other uh, notions, particularly speech act theory. And I'm sure you must have heard of speech act theory, um, which is complementing actually, uh, Grice's approach to meaning. And speech acts, as I said that before, which is locution, which means the actual utterance, illocution, which means the intention of the uh, author, uh, the message, the purpose of the message, and then perlocution, which is the actual effect of that message that you are putting across. Like uh, Grice, Speech act theorists attempt to go beyond the literal meaning of words and structures, classifying uh, utterances according to their implicit rather than explicit function. So you are looking at the impl implicit uh, meaning more than the actual uh, f the function of them uh, that is explicit. And here, of course, in elocutionary uh, or illusionary, what we can say, uh, meaning, illocutionary meaning has to do with the speaker's intention rather than his or her actual words. So when we have heard about, shall we go for a walk, or correct me if I am wrong, or uh, shall we go for a walk and it's raining, it's not really the words, it's raining. This is, th this is not the answer. I mean, the question wasn't, uh, shall we, uh, is it raining or not? It wasn't. So really, you're not looking at the explicit function of it's raining. You're looking at the implicit function of it's raining, which means either that, well, it can mean two things. It can mean, let's go for a walk, even, if, you know, because it's raining. Or we can say, because there's a, a marker used, a, a conjunction, because. Or we don't want to go for a walk because it's raining. So you see, this is an issue of, um, uh, it can work either way in terms of uh, uh, interpreting it. So it has an implicit, as you can see, rather than explicit function. Uh, so it's not the literal meaning of the words, it's raining and structure, but it goes beyond that one, uh, beyond the utterance itself into the intention. Uh, that's what speech acts are about. The intention of the author uh, or, or the uh, effect of the text on the audience, 
and what's the effect of that on the audience uh, and that is really what is very very important uh, there are still more um, uh, uh, information about indirect speech acts is an utterance whose literal meaning or the literal force is conventionally inadequate within the context and must be repaired by some inference I mean you have to repair it you have to infer that he is not talking about the rain it's raining you know because the literal meaning is inadequate. You say, it's raining. He asked, shall we go for a walk? And the answer was, it's raining. I mean, is that adequate? It's inadequate. Within the context, with, with the context, it's inadequate. And this is what Levinson is saying. He's saying it's an indirect speech act. It's an utterance whose literal meaning or literal force is conventionally inadequate with the context. It is not related to context because we are talking about a walk. Shall we go for a walk? And the answer is it is raining and there is no... So you, have, you must repair the inference and see, understand what that is. There's also Brown and Yo, which is in 1983. He says there is an overlap between re relevance, what's relevant, and the principle of local interpretation, which instructs the hearer, the person who hears you, not to construct a context any larger than he needs to arrive at an interpretation. When we say about relevance, when he says, you know, I have a, I, I'm coming to collect my sick pay. Why don't I have my sick pay? I have six children. Can you tell me why? Now, of course, the answer is going to be um, collecting your sick pay, of course. Why he's not collecting. I mean, the, the clerk who works in the finance department is not going to tell him why he didn't have any ch six children. Obviously, but because it's not relevant. So you are actually, when you are looking at that one and seeing the relevance of the text, you are connecting only what's relevant, what's adequate. And in the same case, it's raining. What is adequate to, shall we go for a walk? Is it adequate? Uh, it's not conventionally inadequate with the context. It is raining. Because it, nobody asks, about whether it's raining or not. But there is an element here. It's raining, shall we go for a walk? Or it's raining, we shouldn't go for a walk. So in other words, the answer by the hearer, the person who receives that message, it can be either way. It can be that we, we, it's raining, we're not going to go for a walk. Or it's raining, let's go for a walk to enjoy the rain while we're walking. Thank you.